Well, hey, good morning, everybody. We didn't hear pre-roll going, so that was a little awkward, but that's okay. <laughs> Easter is right around the corner, but the celebration starts right now. Let's go ahead and stand up and worship together. Search the world, but he couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend, because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing. Um, we're so excited that you're here, whether you're on Facebook Live or you're here with us in person. Um, we have a few announcements for you this morning. So. Well, good morning. Uh, so glad that you guys are here with us. Um, I may be too close. I'm not sure. Uh, a good week starts with a great Sunday, and that's what Pastor Chip is is kind of wanting us to jump start. I mean, it is Easter Sunday in a couple of weeks, and what better way, like Brandon said, than to start celebrating now. Let all those inhibitions go. In Psalms 22, 3, it says that God inhabits the praises of his people. No doubt that he is here today. He is here. And you know, all of our pain and our brokenness and our, our hurt, he's here to mend that. And I just encourage you to to worship and just dig deep and press into the Father today because He will heal you. You are not alone. Uh, I know that I've needed that lately and I know that um, He wants to connect with us. So as we worship and we finish singing Graves in the Garden, I mean, we are alive and that's what we want to see today. We want to see that joy. So I love you guys and uh, thank you for this. Now small groups is still going on. Involve yourself in small groups. Next week is Palm Sunday, and that's going to be amazing. And we're going to have a lot of good things, so bring your family out. Um, but again, let's just worship the Father today. We love you. Morning to dancing, you give beauty for ashes. 
you turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one.
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Good. 
And you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me die. And you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me die. God, we thank you for today. God, this this awesome opportunity, God, to to gather together on a Sunday and just just praise your name, God. We we believe that this morning, God, that no matter what situation we may be facing in life, no matter how how low the the valley might seem, God, we we know that you're with us, God. The, just like you're with us on the mountaintop, God, you're you're with us in the struggle, God. You willingly put on disgusting human flesh, God, and joined us in, uh, joined us on earth, God, and we, we praise you for that. We praise you for Jesus. We praise you for never giving up on us. And God, even when we run so far away, God, you're, you're there to, to call us back to you, God. We praise you for that. Be with Chip this morning as he brings us your word, God, as we can dive deeper into your word, God, to learn more about who you are and learn how to, to follow you with our whole hearts, God. God, take our, take our time, take our talents, take our money, take whatever you want, God, whatever, whatever it takes. We're here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. On Friday afternoon, I, uh, I was cleaning the house, as you know, you have to do when you're an adult. And uh, I didn't want to be, because even though I'm an adult, you know, I'm not a robot. Um, so I didn't really want to be cleaning the house, but I was. And I, what I wanted to be doing was watching the Baylor Bears play in the NCAA tournament. Um, that, should, that I didn't hear a large gasp come from the crowd, because... That's not surprising. Um, and so I, I couldn't because we had other things that we had to do. And so I did, though, find that there was an app that I could download onto my phone called NCAA March Madness. And you can stream three hours of tournament footage for free. And so I'm like, well, that may be the entire length of Baylor's run in the tournament. So that's fine. And so I, I downloaded the app. And as I was downloading the app, Dax was what my son was watching me download the app and he said oh March Madness <clears throat> is that a game I said no it's a it's a streaming platform and he said oh for video I said yeah so I'll be able to watch March Madness on my phone and he said okay well why do you want to watch March Madness I said because Baylor's in it this year and they got a number one seed and he said that's fantastic I'm so happy. I know that, you know, you're a big Baylor fan, and so you must be really happy about that. And I said, I am. And then I told him about, you know, how great a team Baylor has and that I, you know, expect that they might be able to even possibly go all the way. And, you know, and, and he was, you know, was like, that was, that's great. I'm really, like, I'm so excited. I'm so happy for you and for Baylor. I just, like, in the apps loading and doing all this, I just have one question. What is uh, March Madness? I was like, oh, huh. and I realized I'd had this whole conversation with my son that he had no idea what the conversation really signified. Like, it's all about March Madness, but he doesn't have any understanding of what March Madness really is. And I'm like, it's a basketball tournament. He says, oh, basketball. 
Okay, good. Well, that's great. Well, then we'll watch a basketball game, right? And he was just happy to do that. But sometimes it's like, I feel like we are walking through our Christian lives and there are things that God has, has commanded us to do. There's things that Jesus has instructed us to do that he has modeled for us. And I think that sometimes it's like, you know, a, a 10-year-old in March badness. Like, what? Like, I, I get that it's, that it's this and it's this and this, but what is it really? What is this really about? So this morning, I want to talk about, a, I want to tell a story of Jesus healing a young boy. He heals a boy, and he gives the disciples some instruction that I think clarify what it's about. I think the instructions that he gives to the disciple give us a clear picture of something that he has instructed us many times to do, something that he has modeled for us. But I think the way he describes it, the way it's described in this passage in Matthew chapter 17 and also in Mark chapter 8, this same story, I think it points to say this is what it's about. So if you will, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. Now, immediately after, the story we're going to get to is a little later in in the chapter, but the first part of Matthew chapter 17 is the story of the transfiguration. And the transfiguration, if you don't have, if you don't know it, let me just real quickly, the transfiguration is this amazing event where Jesus takes three of his disciples up onto a mountaintop. He takes these three disciples, John, uh, James, and Peter. He takes them up onto the mountaintop, and while he is there, he is transfigured. He goes from being just a normal looking person like us to suddenly the, the glory of the Lord shines through him. That he is one minute has regular skin and maybe, you know, a, a beard, you know, um, maybe even, you know, some blemishes, some scars, normal looking guy. And then in an instant, he looks like the sun that he is shining so brightly that it's, it's almost as if, it's as if the, the Shekinah glory of the Lord is put on display right there on the mountain with these disciples, these three watching. And not only that, but then two other people are there with him. Moses, the great prophet of the Old Testament, leader of the Israelites, taking them from bondage into the promised land. Moses is there. And Elijah, the, maybe the second greatest prophet in the history of Israel, is there. And they're there with Jesus, talking to him. And the disciples see this and they're, they're amazed, right? Like they're just amazed. They, they, they immediately understand this is Moses. And they understand this is Elijah. And they're talking to Jesus, and, and their first thought is, hey, we need to build tents for these guys so that they can be comfortable. And, and they offer to build tents, and, and, and Jesus, he doesn't want a tent, but God speaks. Like the Father speaks audibly. And he says something similar to what he said when Jesus was baptized. He says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. But then he adds something. Not only this is my son in whom I am well pleased, he says, listen to him right listen to him and jesus says we're we're not going to do this tent thing we're not going to set up some cathedral on this mountaintop where people can come and bask in the glow of that's not my point here that's not my purpose here i love the transfiguration because you know we say transfiguration which is you know to sort of change the figure of something but i like to think of it more as as that the veil of human flesh was lifted. That for just a minute, this picture of Jesus, they got to see him in his true glory. And it amazed them. This points to Jesus' majesty and his power. It's this really uh, just an amazing moment in Jesus' ministry. And this next story is what follows that. And it is, such a, it is such a change. It is such a change of pace. It's like going from like zero to Mach 2 like, like that. Because it is such a change. It's like going from staying in a nice hotel where everything is clean to coming home to your kids. Right? It's, like, it's like that. It's like, oh, did the kids clean the house while we were gone? No, they crafted, which is the opposite of cleaning in every way. 
because, yeah, not only do you not come home to a clean house, you come home to a dirty house that you have to pretend you're excited about a paper bag shaped like baby Yoda. That's what Jesus is, except he doesn't feign excitement for the disciples. He doesn't pretend that he's impressed. Instead, he lets them know what their performance has been like. We're going to read Matthew 17. Verses 14 and 15 is where we'll begin. Verse, verse 14 says, And when they came to the crowd, this they being Jesus and his disciples, the three, came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. Now, the ESV translates this as epileptic and maybe a better translation says that he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. There is a clever and important, a very careful bit of rhetoric that the father does here. And I want to take just a minute before we go on to describe what he does. He doesn't just say, my son has seizures. He doesn't just say, my son has seizures. He goes on and he describes the, the depths or the, the, um, the magnitude, I guess, of the seizures and saying he suffers terribly. Now, the way that this is described, Matthew's wording here that he suffers terribly he uses that same wording to describe Jesus' suffering on the cross. So this isn't just, it's, it's like a, a real bad boo-boo. Like he's saying, my son is in agony from these seizures. My son is in agony. Now we're going to find out that, that what's happening here is demonic possession, that this young man is, is being taken over by a, a demon that is causing his body to seize and convulse. Mark, when he describes the story, he tells us right from the beginning, the, son, the father knows this is a demon. Jesus recognizes it's a demon. Everybody knows it's a demon. Matthew, he saves that for a little bit, but I think it's important for us to recognize that this isn't just a medical condition, but that there's a spiritual situation going on as well, that this demon is, is taking hold of his body. And then he says, and it throws him into the fire and into the water. This is where the father was so careful. This is where I think the father was really clever in the way he talks about his son's condition. He does what what's sometimes it's called feature benefit analysis or, or feature impact analysis. If you're in, in sales, you may have heard this terminology. Whereas the feature is something that just exists, right? It's something that, that exists. Um, for instance, you might say that um, my house has a deck looking out over the backyard. That's a fact. The house has a deck. deck. That's a feature. Now, that's not the point of impact, though. If you were trying to sell that house, you would say, this house has a lovely deck on the backyard. Now, the lovely, that only kind of describes the magnitude of it or something, but here's the impact. It has a deck overlooking the backyard so you can watch your kids and grandkids play. You see? That's the impact. To say it has a deck, that's like, okay, nice, it has a deck. But when you say, so you can watch your kids and grant, oh, it's personalized there. Now we're not just talking about the feature, we're really talking about how that feature impacts life. He doesn't just say, my son has seizures. He says, those seizures sometimes send him into fire or into the water. So it isn't just an a, you know, uncomfortable thing. It isn't just an inconvenience. It is threatening his life point of impact. He doesn't just talk about the feature, he talks about the impact. And when Jesus hears this, he takes action. Verse 16 says this, I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. He points out, I've already talked to your disciples about this, but I'm bringing it to you. I'm bringing this to you. In fact, Matthew three different times describes the disciples' failure. Three different times, he's like, the disciples couldn't do this. The disciples couldn't do this. The disciples couldn't do this, right? Like, if you were a disciple, like last week we talked about Peter walking on the water and how ultimately that kind of turns into failure, right? I wonder what it was like to be Peter, right, in this story. You've been up on the mountaintop. You've seen the transfiguration, and then you come back down, and the disciples that were making fun of you last week because you took a bath in front of Jesus, 
now there, everybody's like, the disciples couldn't do this. He's like, oh, the disciples couldn't do this. He's talking about you guys. He's not talking about me. I wasn't the failure this time. This is your failure. But again and again, the disciples could not do this. And then, eventually, in fact, Jesus will describe their failure before they get to. Verse 17, though, Jesus answers. He says, oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. A faithless and twisted generation. Faithless describes their, their connection to God, that it is weak, that it is very much a one-sided connection, that it is God holding on to them and they are doing nothing to hold back to God, that God is reaching for them and they are looking every other way. They're faithless and they are twisted, that their, that their view of the world is, is distorted. You can even describe this word, can even be translated as, as a perverse generation. He says, you, you guys have everything backwards. And instead of being faithful to God, you're faithful everywhere else. You're faithless towards God. He says, how long am I to be with you? You wonder maybe why? I don't think we have to wonder why, really. Like we understand why Jesus is having this sort of thought right here. He's just been on the mountaintop. He's just been on the mountaintop in this place of, of majesty, of transfiguration. He's just been at this high water mark of his life, and now it's back to them. He's gone from perfection to these disciples, and the word is helpless, helpless, helpless. His power was put on such display. And now the disciples who have followed him around and supposed to have learned from him are just helpless. They cannot do this thing. In verse 18, Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly. The boy was healed instantly. Verse 19, the disciples wonder. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? Right? And Jesus, he answers them. Even though he wasn't present, even though he wasn't present, he answers them immediately. He knows. Sometimes, sometimes people will ask me, why didn't this work? My kids will say, like, hey, in fact, yesterday we were ripping up some, we were pulling nails. And they were like, why why are you able to do it so fast and, and we're not? And my question was, show me how you're doing it. Show me what you're doing and I'm going to look at how you're doing this and then I'm going to make some recommendations, some pointers. I'm going to kind of show you where to hold the hammer, how to move things, right? And cause so that you can be as fast or faster than I am. Like I, I look at how you're doing it. Jesus doesn't have to do that. There's no point of assessment here. He knows exactly how that demon was cast out and because he knows exactly how that's supposed to be done, he knows exactly what they didn't do. He knows exactly what they did wrong. And he describes it in verse 20. In verse 20, it's this. He says, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you had, have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. He says, the issue is your faith. I sometimes wonder what the disciples did. Like, what do they actually do when they see the boy with the seizures? Like, what did they actually try? Like, did they try, like, throwing water on him? Did they say, peace, be still? You know, what thing did they, did they touch him? Did they lay hands on him? I wonder if they took their prayer shawl, right? Because we know that Jesus' prayer shawl, people found healing in his wings. Did they take their prayer shawl and put it out and, and, and touch him with their prayer shawl to see if that would work? If maybe their prayer shawl could be magical, I wonder what they did. I, I don't know what they did. I know what they didn't do. Because Mark, Mark tells this story, and when they ask Jesus why they weren't able to cast out the demon, in Mark chapter 8, verse 29, he says this. He asked them, but that's the wrong verse. I'm so sorry, Lori, I gave you the wrong verse. And <laughs> in, in Mark, when he's describing this passage, when he's describing what they did wrong, he says, this kind of demon can only be cast out by prayer. It's only through prayer. 
you couldn't, you couldn't touch it with a tassel and cast it out. You couldn't throw water on it and cast it out. You couldn't rub mud on it and cast it out. You couldn't just command it to come out. Only through prayer could you cast this demon out. What did Jesus do, though? Did Jesus pray? No. He doesn't say, Heavenly Father, please, something. He doesn't ask God to deliver this boy from the demon. He doesn't pray at all. He just commands the demon to leave, and it leaves. Because he has authority. Because he has the authority to cast that demon out. He has the authority to say, demon, be gone, and the demon's gone. He has the authority to say, you know, demon, go from here into that pig over there, and the demon obeys. That's Jesus' authority. The disciples don't have that authority. They access God's authority by prayer. Why didn't they pray? Why didn't they pray? Well, maybe... Because maybe they hadn't seen Jesus pray for something like this to happen. Maybe that was it. Maybe they were nervous. I, I can't say exactly why they didn't pray except for this, is that they didn't have, have enough faith to pray. They didn't have enough faith to pray because the significance of this story isn't just that G D Jesus could cast out a demon. That's, that's not a surprise to anybody. We see that numerous times in the Scripture. What's really significant about this story, what it's all about, is Jesus here, he doesn't instruct them how to pray. He does that somewhere else. He doesn't tell them exactly why to pray. He does that several times other places. He says this is the significance of prayer. Prayer is a sign of faith. When you pray, it is a sign of faith. It shows, it shows that you have faith that God is listening says you have faith that God is paying attention to you when you talk to him one of the most annoying things that that I hear a lot is um, dad sometimes I love hearing that I remember the first time I ever heard one of my kids call me dad in fact, I remember the first time that each of them called me dad daddy da different things but um, there comes a point when you know kids are a little more grown that you really hate to hear that, right? Or mom, 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 mama, mom, ma, over and over and over again, right? And as many times I've like, listen, you just, you just have to say dad once. Like, well, I didn't know if you were listening. My, our prayers aren't God. God, 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 right? We don't, we don't have to do that because there's, we understand if we have any faith at all, we have faith that God is listening, that he is paying attention to us, that he hears us when we call out to him. And there's, we don't have to necessarily, we can say God, we can say Father, we can say all kinds of things to address him that are biblical. And no matter how it is that we address him, He's listening. Prayer is a sign of faith. And it tells us that not only is he listening, but that he cares. That he cares about the things that we are talking to him about. That he cares about the, the minutia and details of our lives. He is listening and he cares. Prayer is a sign of our faith because we have faith that God in some way will answer. We Sometimes some of our prayers are just we want God to know how we feel about things. But also we expect that God in some way answers. We have prayer. We have faith when we pray. It shows our faith because we, have, we believe that God has the power to work. We call out to him because we know that he has the power to not just answer, but to answer powerfully, to make situations change. We know that he has the power to do things, even when sometimes he doesn't. We still have faith, and by praying, we display that faith. We show that faith. This week, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to challenge you to do something. I'm going to challenge you to spend one hour in prayer. One hour, one solid hour. Start at 
o'clock and at o'clock. It doesn't have to be that, but just an hour in prayer. Not a minute here and a minute there, accumulating to be an hour, but to set aside one hour to pray. I want to challenge you to do this this week because it's a sign of our faith. It's a sign of our faith, and if, if we have a problem setting aside one hour to pray, what does that tell us about our faith? If we can't make one hour to spend alone with our Heavenly Father, what does that point to us about our faith? It should tell us that, that this criticism that Jesus has of the disciples, you have little faith, you twisted generation, that that's not just them. If we can't set aside one hour to pray. Set aside one hour to pray. And here's, I have four things that I want to talk with you about before we go. And that is the four things I think will make it to where you can spend an extended amount of time in prayer. The first is to set aside every distraction. Set aside every distraction. Set aside cell phones, televisions, noises, whatever it is that distracts you. Your, your poodle. Whatever it is that threatens to pull you away from time spent with your heavenly father, set it aside. Carve out an hour without distractions. Sometimes this is, is very hard in modern life because we have those cell phones with us all the time. Some of us have cell phones that you know, we have to be able to answer for work. Give your cell phone to a trusted friend and say, if it's an emergency, bring it to me. If it's not an emergency, tell them I'll call them back. And then maybe let the first thing you pray about be, Lord, please give me a one uninterrupted hour. Set aside every distraction. Have, have the discipline to carve time out to spend with our Heavenly Father. Second thing is to let scriptures guide your thoughts. Let scriptures guide your thoughts. Spend a little time in the Word. You don't have to, don't spend the whole hour just reading, but read a passage. Read until the Lord speaks to you in a profound way through the scriptures, and then dwell on that. Think about all the ways that should impact your life. All the ways that should play out in your existence and walking through day to day. Spend a little bit of time and let the scriptures guide your thoughts. The third thing is to uh, give your hands something to do. Give your hands something to do. A lot of times when we talk about praying, we you know, cast our hands like this, maybe like this, maybe the other way if you're left-handed, I don't know. Right? We do some things with our hands. Uh, there was a, a time where I, for, for, actually for a long time, um, when I was praying, I would hold a nail. Went to Home Depot and found, as best I could, a nail that I looked like it would nail somebody to a cross, and I would hold that nail while I prayed. And it was a, an important reminder to me that as I was thinking, I've got other things to do, I've got other things to do, I've got other things to do, I've got other places to be, I thought, I thought about Jesus' sacrifice and thought about how important I was to him that he would choose to take these nails instead of doing all of the other things that he could have done. And it would bring me back, it would bring my thoughts back to focus on, on him focus on my prayers. You might do something with your hands like needlework. I had a friend whose grandmother knitted, and she had different colors of, of yarn, and as she prayed for her, her kids and her grandkids, she would change colors. She would change colors, and my friend told me that one year for Christmas, she gave her this blanket, and it was a really big blanket, and she said, I made this blanket between this date and this date, and this color right here is for you. And every one of these little knots I tied was a prayer for you. And she says she looked at it and she sees this teal color running throughout this blanket. And she said he was just overwhelmed with her grandmother's love for her that she would take the time to put all of these prayers together for her. So maybe needlework. Maybe it's hammering nails into a board. 
Maybe it's, maybe it's just to light candles. And every time you change the, top, the thing that you're thinking about, the thing you're praying for, the person you're praying for, whatever it is, light another candle. I, I don't know what it might be for you that can help you to use your hands not to distract you and pull you away, but to focus and bring your thoughts on your Heavenly Father. But find a way to give your hands something to do. And the last thing is I would say follow the example that we have from this Father and pray for points of impact. Pray for points of impact. Because I think that when we pray for points of impact, we really begin to pray deeply. We begin to pray deeply. I've prayed for many of you over the past few years as you've had medical situations come up. And it's, hopefully everyone's experience is this, that if you come to me and you tell me that I'm going to have a surgery on this day, or I'll say, can I pray with you right now? Because I want to pray immediately. I don't want it to be something like, I'm going to pray for you later and then maybe forget. And maybe, you know, I, right now I want to pray for you. Because I know that if I pray for you right now, I'm going to remember that. And I'm going to continue to pray for you from now through the time of surgery. So I'm going to say, I want to pray with you right now. And when I pray for somebody going through surgery, I don't say, dear God, let this surgery go well. Amen. It's good. We're good, right? I did the thing, right? I prayed for your surgery, so like I'm done, right? No, that's, that's not. That's not it. When I pray for somebody going into surgery, I don't just pray that the surgery goes well. I think about, I think about, when you think about it, what do you want, what do you want someone to pray for you about when you're going into surgery? I pray that, that it, not only that it goes well, but I, I pray that that they won't have too much fear or anxiety moving into this surgery. That I pray God give them peace moving into this surgery. Lord, I pray that, that the doctor will do his absolute best work on this day. That he'll get a good night's sleep the night before, that he'll be well rested, that he won't be distracted. Pray that the nurses will have a loving care for this person during their surgery and in their post-surgery and their care afterwards. I'm gonna pray for... Their, this person's spouse and their family, that during the surgery, they're not going to be overcome with anxiety, that they're going to have some peace through the surgery, right? I, I'm going to explore each of those things connected to the surgery. I'm not going to just say, God, help, help the surgery go well. Now, why? Does it, make, does it make an eternal difference? Does it make an eternal difference? Like the fact that I'm trying to pray with depth around a situation, does it matter to God? I, th I think it does a little bit. I think it does because, because I have made my petition known to my Heavenly Father, not in some sort of cavalier, casual sort of way, but I've let him know we're serious about this. This is important to us because I'm exploring this in my mind. I'm thinking about this. I'm, I'm really taking this to heart. I'm trying to, I want to be empathetic. And Lord, I want you to understand that, that this is meaningful. It isn't, it isn't just the boy's having seizures. It's these seizures are horrible. And they cast him into the water. They cast him into fire. We want to pray with depth. My kids pray for the people in China. The little ones. I don't know which of you did this, but one of you in one of our kids' classes said we need to pray for Christians for the church in China and when we started making this prayer every night at bedtime it was Lord be with Christians in China or be with the church in China now it has degraded to God be with the people in China and that, a few nights ago I was like you know all the people in China like are we are we asking God to just be with all the people in China because he's already there like, he, he's been in China this whole time. We don't have to ask him to go that he's there. So what are we really praying for? And, and my daughter said, said well, that, that they can stay Christians, that the government doesn't, doesn't put them in jail. I said, great. Let's, instead of just saying be with people in China, let's, let's explore that a little bit more, okay? And so her prayers kind of moved a little bit, and she was you know, explaining to God why she was been praying for these people in China. And, uh, and she learned the lesson well. 
And then uh, the next night, as we were going through our prayers, she got me. She got me because we have been, for the last almost two years, every night when I put Baylor to bed, we have prayed for Miss Crystal, who was Baylor's pre-K teacher who lost her son almost two years ago. And we have prayed for Miss Crystal every single night. And like a couple of weeks ago, she said, God, be with Crystal, because I know she still misses her son. We don't want to just pray on a surface level. We don't want to just say words that are meaningless. We want to explore the meaning. We want to understand what, what our brothers and sisters in Christ are going through. We want to be able to connect with them meaningfully. We want to be able to make petitions to our Heavenly Father in a way like this man pleading for his son. That is the picture of what a prayer should be like. It is us saying, God, we have faith. We have faith that you're able to deliver us. We have faith that you're able to act powerfully. We know you can. And I'm bringing this to you not just because somebody's asked me to, not because I just feel an obligation for it, but because it is important. We're bringing this to you because because our brothers and sisters are hurting. Because our brothers and sisters are in, are in bad situations. And we know that you can deliver them. And so we come to you. Because we know that you have the power. My challenge to you this week is that you would take an hour. That you would set it aside to do nothing. But pray. To let. To let not only your faith be on display to God, but to give him a chance to grow your faith through prayer. Let's pray together right now. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are always listening, that you care enough to always pay attention that we don't have to <laughs> pull on on your sleeve and say your name again and again and again but that we can just talk to you. We are so thankful that you are able to answer us. That you're able to answer us in, in things that we perceive in prayer. A still small voice. A feeling of peace. Guiding our minds in a certain direction that you answer us in your word, that you answer us through the words of, of trusted friends. And Lord, we are so thankful for your power to work, for your power to accomplish so much. Lord, we, we cry out to you in prayer. Forgive us for the times that we haven't taken it seriously, that we haven't treated it with the reverence that it deserves. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be people who pray with depth, to be people who pray for those, those points of impact because it makes us more sensitive to what our brothers and sisters are going through because it makes us more empathetic. But also because that is the way that you understand us. Help us to pray deeply so that we can see the world as you do. Lord, I pray that you would grant us each an hour this week or more to have time to be able to connect with you. I pray, Lord, that this morning, that this morning, if there's any here who hasn't made that point of connection with you, who hasn't found a a time of meaningful impact where you have come into their life to change it forever. I pray that today might be the day of salvation for them. I pray that as we enter into this time of invitation that your spirit would move in their heart, that you would speak to them clearly to say, go, that this invitation is for you. Let them know that 
that you are that father pleading that they would be healed, that you are the one with the power to heal them. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, stand with me as we have this time of invitation. Well. My future hangs on this. You make preciousness from dust. Please don't. Stop creating me. Your blood offers the chance to rewind to innocence. Be born perfect as a child. Oh, your cross, it changes everything. There, my world begins anew. Oh, your cross, it's where my hope restarts. A second chance is heaven's heart. When sin and ugliness Collide with redemption's kiss Beauty awakens by romance Always inside this mess I have found forgiveness Mercy as infinite as you Oh, your cross, it changes everything my world begins anew with you. Oh, your cross is where my hope restarts. A second chance is heaven's heart. Countless second chances.
my first. All right, if you will have a seat, we have just a few announcements. The first is that our family fun day is coming up. It'll be next Sunday, next Sunday. And so we would like for you to invite everyone you know, like everybody, just invite everybody. We want to have a, a huge crowd here. We want to be able to meet a lot of our neighbors and uh, let them know that there is a place here that they can come and worship the Lord together with us. And so that'll be next Sunday. And we there is in your bulletin an opportunity to volunteer. You can fill out that form. Let us know how you'd like to help us. We've gotten a, a good response so far, but I know that there are still a lot of opportunities out there for people to serve. And so if you're willing to serve, please fill out that card to let us know. And we will be in touch with you by Tuesday. We'll send out an email telling everybody sort of where they're going to be and what they're going to need to do to be prepared. And so we'll, we'll have that. And so also one other thing somebody asked me um, was how are we supposed to dress for family fun day? And I'm just going to go ahead and say blue jeans, right? They're good. You can dress them up. You can dress them down. They can be a little dressy, a little casual. So next Sunday, if you're comfortable, you, you have my blessing to wear blue jeans and you can wear an NOBC shirt and we can all you know be comfortable while we're out there meeting our, our neighbors and um, having that experience together so please make sure to fill out your cards today so we can uh, know how many people we have yeah, and if you're watching online there is an online card as well by going to nobcfamily.com and click on family fun day and so we want to include everyone who's able to, to be here uh, next week. And uh, it's going to be awesome. And so I uh, also just want to remind you, too, as you're going online, uh, too, uh, all of our registrations should be up for a youth camp. Uh, we're having a junior high camp and a senior high camp this year at Lake Tomahawk. And so I want to encourage you to, to start signing up now. And also, if you need scholarships, uh, we, we never want uh, finances to keep a student from getting to go to one of our camps or mission trips. And so if you can provide a scholarship, we always appreciate those. And for our students who need one, uh, just talk to one of your pastors, and we'll get you uh, connected with that. Uh, we're also going back to Mission Arlington this year, the first part of June. And so be praying for our kids as we go there and, and do Backyard Bible Club. It's a great way to spend your summer. And then VBS slash Kid Week is coming up in uh, the last part of June. And so if you'd like to help with that, uh, just also, uh, there's not one of the, the choices on the card, but just let us know. Because uh, this past week I heard one person who we assumed were, was helping with something and said, hey, I can't help this year. So it's good to know uh, the stars we're making those plans uh, now. All right. And two weeks from today will be Easter. And so my question is, who are you going to invite? Okay, you haven't decided yet. That's okay. You've got a couple of weeks. Um, but I'm probably going to ask again next week, who are you going to invite? And I, I hope that you'll have at least a name. And if you have like 15 or 20, I'll wait. You can go through your whole list during this time, and you can tell me all the people that you're going to invite. But invite somebody to, to church for Easter. Uh, I, I feel like it is stamped on our hearts that as Easter approaches, that God has put it on us that we want to be in church. We want to be connected to the Lord and to his family, to our church family. And so invite somebody. There are people who haven't been here because of COVID stuff and a lot of people are getting their vaccines. That's great. If they're, you know, if they are vaccinated, feel well enough to come, if they're willing to wear a mask, whatever the situation, invite them. Even if you know there is no way you're getting them out of the house, invite them anyway. Invite them anyway because it feels good to be invited places. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it even feels good to say no to an invitation. That, that may be more of a personal problem. But like, it, it feels good to be invited places. So invite, hey, did you invite Gil? You did, okay, good. Sorry, he told me last week he was gonna invite some. Like I told you, next week I'm gonna ask you, if you who you inv you're inviting, so I'm serious about it. So invite somebody, figure out who you're going to invite, invite people to church for Easter. There are people who may just be waiting for you to ask them to come to church with them. So. And, and just like last Wednesday, on Wednesdays now are, are devotions at noon, and it's kind of more like a talk show format, kind of walking through the scripture together. I want to encourage you to join us on Facebook. Uh, and last week, Chip kind of threw me a curveball and said, hey, if you've got a question, stump Rusty by sending yes. us your questions. And so I want to say, hey, as he's encouraging you to invite a friend, text him who you're inviting. Because yeah. that gives them someone to pray for this week, too, uh, by name. And so when we meet them on Easter or Family Fun Day, and so uh, I'll throw him a curveball to blow yeah. up his phone with your text. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> so just nothing but love. Nothing but love. I'll, I'll not only pray for everybody that you text me that you're going to invite. I'll not only pray for that person. I'll pray for you as you invite them. And I'll even do my best to memorize their name 
so that when you introduce me on Easter, I can, I can know their name ahead of time. And Chip we'll is really gifted, works. really gifted at that. I'm pretty good at it. So, and we'll so, see. Uh, so it's going to be good. We're really looking forward to Family Fun Day and to Easter. And just want to remind our deacons today we have a meeting at 4 o'clock on Zoom. And then also, if you walk through the building over there today, actually the floor, they pulled up the stuff on the floor, like all the walls are painted, the ceiling grid is in. Uh, Trisha was saying it's too bright now because uh, all of our lights work. <laughs> which yeah, the lights that's kind of kind of crazy. But uh, it's really looking good over there, talking to the painter on Friday. Uh, said everything should be done by Easter Sunday except for like the floors, the pews, and the sound and lighting. So it's getting closer, getting closer. So uh, just being prayer for safety for our teams as they continue to work um, right. and finish up the building. All right. And that's all the, all the announcements that we have. Um, does anybody have anything else before we go? All right, then uh, let, us, let me say a word of prayer for us as we depart. Y'all stand with me as we pray. Most gracious Father, Lord, I thank you for how amazing you are and how amazing you are to us. Lord, your grace, it, it overwhelms us. Lord, I pray that you would give us time this week to connect with you. Give us a heart to connect with you on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Let us pray deeply. Let us find direction in your word. Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to, to grow in our faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before you go, let me say one other thing. If, if you t take this challenge and you do it and you carve out an, an hour of your prayer, um, why don't you post on, on Facebook? Let us know about it. You can tag North Orange or me or Rusty about it. I, I'm curious to see you know, how this goes. Maybe we can encourage other people to do the same thing. One hour challenge. All right. Y'all have a great week.